Welcome. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. And we're really pleased to be doing this program today, um, celebrating Ruth Weiss's new book, Free as a Jew, A Personal Memoir of Na National Self-Liberation. Um, we're doing this event in collaboration with the Yiddish Book Center. And we're really pleased to have Aaron Lansky, the founder and president of the Yiddish Book Center here with us to lead today's conversation. Um, before we jump into the event, just a quick word about YIVO. Uh, YIVO is a very special place for the celebration and contemplation of Jewish history and Jewish culture. We have an archive and a library of over 23 million documents and over 400,000 books, which researchers from around the world use. And we bring the world of those collections to life, um, not just for researchers, but also in our public programs, in a variety of classes and exhibitions. And so um, we're grateful for you all joining us today. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Aaron and Ruth. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Alex. Alex, thanks very much. And Ruth, how nice to see you. I have to <laughs> explain to the audience that you and I often have a breakfast together on the Upper East Side and we get to chat in person. And for the last two and a half years, we haven't seen each other once. This is the first time. So you're looking good. Yeah. And you too, my friend. And it is. It's very exciting, even though it isn't over coffee. <laughs> so I want to start out with just a little bit of a, an introduction, and then we'll jump into questions, if that's okay with you, Ruth. So, so um, you uh, give a little reference in your book in passing to the fact that the first time I encountered you was when I was uh, selling fruit juice on the streets of Boston in front of the Boston Public Library in 1976. I was just about to start my last year of college and uh, I had a push cart that I had built myself and there was a sign on the front and it said, fresh squeezed fruit juice and sparkling conversation. But that particular <laughs> day, there was neither fruit juice nor conversation because that morning a friend came up to me and he handed me a very slim book and said, I think you should read this. And it was your book called The Meal is Modern Hero. And I, uh, started reading and I sat behind the cart and that was it. I didn't squeeze another orange all day. And instead I just completely lost myself in the book and read the entire day and loved every word of it. And um, somehow reading your latest book, Free as a Jew was a sort of a bookend to that experience, if you will. You know, it, uh, it brought that full circle in some ways. Uh, your book is really interesting and it's many, many things I have to just explain to the audience. It, um, it's an intellectual memoir. It's a reflection on Jewish history and culture. It's kind of who's who of uh, the luminaries of the Jewish literary and cultural world. It's a political treatise. And it's an often mo moving summation of a remarkable life, Ruth. And so for all those reasons, yeah. I thought it was a terrific read. Um, I should explain that after I read your first book, I said, right there on the street, I said, that is the person with whom I want to study. And so uh, fortunately you were just starting a graduate program then at McGill and I applied and I went up to Montreal and you were a wonderful teacher. You were uh, rigorous, but kind. You were challenging, but always encouraging. You could not have been kinder to me and to the other students in the class. And though I have to admit, I eventually dropped out of graduate school to go save the world's Yiddish books. Nonetheless, you and I have remained friends all these years. And, and, uh, and for that, I am a, uh, Deeply honored that our colleagues at YIVO have invited me to do the interview today. So, thank well, you. You're very welcome. I'm All the right. one. So, you ready for a real question now? Of course, of All course. All right, here we go. So, I'm gonna we're gonna follow our way, sort of more or less, through the uh, course of the book. But I can't do everything. I'll regal off of standing on one foot here. So, we'll squeeze in as much as we possibly can, and still leave enough time for 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 questions. So what's really interesting about the book is not only do you write about Jewish history, but you've actually lived so much of that history yourself and, and to a remarkable degree. Uh, these are not spoilers, I promise, but you were born in Chernovitz in uh, 1936 to a Yiddish speaking family from Vilna. Your parents wanted, I got this from the book now, your parents wanted to name you Tamara, but uh, uh, your do the doctor advised otherwise. He said it wasn't a good time to raise a kid with an overtly Jewish uh, name. But you've certainly made it very clear to everyone in the world exactly who you are and where you, where you come from. Uh, eventually, thanks to your father's prescience, your, your family escaped. I love the photograph of you with your family in front of the Parthenon. Is that what it was? 
and, and you're wearing yes, 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 and you're wearing <laughs> white shoes. shoes, and you're maybe like three or four years old, or four years old, I guess. That that was just kind of perfect. And I like what you said. You said we were refugees masquerading as tourists. Uh, eventually, thanks to your father's outburst in, in Portugal, you managed to get a visa to go through the United States. You made your way up to Montreal, which itself was remarkable at a time when they were saying that one Jew is too many. And somehow you managed to get into the country. Uh, after the war, your parents' friends used to show up at the house uh, to tell about the fate of one or another relative. Uh, you found out, of course, that your beloved aunt had died in the Covenant Ghetto. Uh, you know, others in living a life like that might have fled from such a painful past. But you did exactly the opposite. You spent your professional life exploring it and becoming one of the finest scholars of Yiddish literature the world's ever known. So my question is, first off, there'll be plenty to follow, but the first question is, so what, this is kind of very pace of thick right now. So what made you so different from everybody else? Uh, you know, what made you different from so many of your generation who uh, couldn't leave the past behind fast enough and instead you really tried to explore this world in many, many different ways? Well, the way you put the question is really hard for me to answer because, um, you know, I, I'm a real team player. Um, I, you know, I, I have never thought of myself as being different from anyone else. Um, it, it's still very hard for me to think of myself in that way. And I couldn't believe that other people didn't find exciting exactly what I found exciting. Um, however, uh, it wasn't such a smooth uh, ride as you might think. For one thing, my mother tongue is not Yiddish, as I write in the book. My mother tongue is German. Um, every one of these things that I would say needs some explanation, right? Uh, my mother had, uh, this was the one time in their lives when my parents were actually well-to-do. And in Chernovitz, as they were living, uh, my mother hired a um, nanny for me. She was Jewish, but she was German speaking, and she raised me for four years. And she raised me for four years so singularly that I didn't know a word of Yiddish. So when we left Chernovitz, in fact, I had no language because my parents really were Yiddish speaking. So it wasn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't, yeah, you, one can make it in a smooth road, but it's not that. The other thing is, is as I write, that when we were growing up, you see, I didn't think that we had a historical role at all. It seemed to me that history, history was really being made in my childhood, but it was being made elsewhere. And the two places where it was being made was certainly in Europe for the worse, but also the heroes of the Warsaw ghetto, the heroes of the Vilna ghetto. You know, we heard all these stories. And then in the... <laughs> Palestine, which was becoming the land of Israel. Well, that was really where our focus was. And, and so it was, and also even culturally, um, the cult, Montreal was a wonderful center of Yiddish culture. But to be honest, Montreal knew that the greater center of Yiddish culture was New York, right? So even there, within the Yiddish world, it seemed that the real action was elsewhere. And that we kind of fortunately placed in this wonderful backwater where we would thrive and we would grow, but basically it was not our role to be writing history or generating it in any way. It's only very gradually, and I really mean gradually over time, that, um, that I did begin to realize for various reasons, uh, one step at a time, that it was partly our role to do something really, really to become part of the creative process and not just the consuming process of culture and of history and everything else. But as I say, uh, <laughs> you know, looking back, you can say, gee, wow, you know, look at what you did. It, it, it didn't feel that way at the time. And by the way, I say when you came, um, it was very exciting, Aaron. Um, I mean, I have been so blessed, uh, Miriam, Goldie, there are students out there uh, that have been so wonderful. They themselves know that um, it's really the students who make the program. Um, 
I've always felt as a teacher, by the way, that my role was something that I learned when I began to take elocution lessons. Uh, when I was uh, in grade seven or eight, I took these elocution lessons. And one of the things that we were taught is how you introduce people to one another. And so when you have two people, you're supposed to say, in order that they should learn each other's names, you're supposed to say, Aaron Lansky, meet Shoshana Smith. Shoshana, this is Aaron. And then you can say something about them. So I have always felt that as a teacher, that's exactly what I should be doing. I should be saying, Aaron Lansky, here is Lama Shapiro. Lama Shapiro, here is your reader, Aaron Lansky. Now you go to it and make each other's acquaintance. Well, you certainly did that because I've been in dialogue with those writers ever since I met you. So that certainly worked okay. on that regard. Done then. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm going to next question. So I can't help but notice, despite your uh, disclaimers about Montreal, that you grew up and then lived in two exceptionally polyglot cities, Chernovitz and later Montreal, two cities where there were multiple languages spoken. And where Yiddish sort of snuck in through the back door as a result of that in some ways or... or well, I mean, Genovis was a third Jewish, right? Uh, I think. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. but not necessarily right. Yiddish speaking. You're quite right. Yeah. Right. Although Chernovitz had a Yiddish yichus, of course. In 1908, it was the site of the first international conference where Yiddish was declared a national language of the Jewish people. I got to explain that. Not the national language of the Jewish people, but a national language of the Jewish people. But that in itself seemed like a huge victory at the time, I think. And... Uh, <laughs> It was also home to a great many, kind of a disproportionate number of Yiddish luminaries in, in, in some ways. You have a longer list than I am sure, but uh, Itzik Manger, Eliezer Steinberg, Mordechai Shefta, more recently Asya Weissman Shulman, who is the head of our own Yiddish language institute here. All of you came from Chernovitz. There was clearly something in the air or in the water. And then of course you came to Montreal, which might not have been uh, New York, any more than Vilna was Warsaw, but it was certainly a center of Yiddish culture to a degree that existed in very few other places in the world, maybe in Melbourne, maybe in Cape Town. There were, there were other places where Yiddish thrived in that way, but certainly far more so uh, than New York, if not in numbers, than just in the depth of, of the culture that was allowed to, to thrive. That you yourself write in your book, you say, Jews in Montreal were under no great pressure to assimilate. So can you explain this to us? What did Chernovitz and Montreal have in common that allowed Yiddish to flourish as it, as it has in so few other places in, in our times? Well, look, the person who put it most precisely is, uh, was one of my uh, very, very good friends, Professor Ezra Mendelssohn, professor of Jewish history, a marvelous writer also, may I say. Well, he wrote a book on Jewish politics and, um, the book itself is, you know, uh, it's not the last word on Jewish politics, but at the very beginning of the book, he answers your question, actually. He says that the best place for a Jewish community, just a Yiddish speaking community, but for a Jewish community, is not a country like the United States of America. Uh, although he's not saying it negatively against the United States of America, but he means it's not a country that is really uniformly. Uh, unilingual um, and a melting pot, thinks of itself as being a melting pot, but the best place for a Jewish community to flourish is where there are ethnicities that are already in interaction with one another and sometimes even in conflict with one another. So Montreal and Chernovitz and many communities in Europe actually, more than in North America, have that quality. Montreal, you see, as you know very, very well, um, has a French community and an English community. And um, in our time, really, never the twain should meet. Nowadays, it's much more merged. But in those days, these were separate communities. And most significantly, the law said Jews, for the purposes of education, will be considered Protestant. I love that because I think that's what was... The public school system in the United States also said that, but it didn't put it in those terms. So when a lot of these Jews came to Montreal, they said, well, yes, but we're not Protestant. So if we have to pay taxes to the Protestant school board, OK, we have to do that because the law says we have to. But do we have to send our children to Protestant schools, which, by the way, were 
Protestant schools, just as the Catholic schools were Catholic schools. So you see, if the French schools were ethnically French, linguistically French, religiously Catholic, the Protestant schools were ethnically English, linguistically English, and religiously Protestant, it made great sense for the Jews to see themselves as a distinct community where they would have Jewish day schools. And in my day, may I say, here, were the, here was the, and I love laying this out, this was the Jewish day school world in which I grew up, starting from the extreme left, the communist Morris Vinchevsky school, the socialist Avram Raisin school, the left-wing labor Zionist parrot school, the right-wing labor Zionist Volksschule, the, um, the, the um, Talmud Torah, which was Hebraic and so on. And then at the very end of the spectrum, there was also the Adath Israel, which was already a Mizrahi school. And then the Lubavitch, uh, the Hasidic schools and the more Orthodox schools came really during mm -hmm. and after the war. Um, so it was a whole world, uh, you know, of, of uh, as you say, very rich in uh, Jewish culture, but the place was there, you see, it was kind of, it was waiting to be realized. There was a slot to be filled and there was nothing to assimilate to, really. I mean, what, what were you going to assimilate to? Yeah, were you going to assimilate to the Protestant world? Were you going to assimilate to the Catholic world? You see, it wasn't constituted that way. So, well, all right. I don't want to out you here, but I do know that you write in your book that you uh, lived at first in Westmount when you were in Montreal, which is a, is it fair to say a Tony section of the city? Well, just on the borderline of Westmount when we first came. Oh, in that case, not so yes. terrible. All right. Okay. Nishka Fela. Yeah. So you grew up on the borderline of Westmount then. Yes. But uh, uh, I think that was probably a place many aspired to. You talk about how when you first went off to school, you went to public school, Protestant school at the beginning, and you write that you vomited every day. This is your writing, not mine. And uh, uh, so your parents were well-to-do, and they could have lived anywhere they wanted, but they chose to uh, kind of be downwardly mobile instead, in the sense that they moved to Outremont and closer to the old Jewish uh, neighborhood there where Yiddish was probably still spoken in the streets and was certainly spoken in the bakery, as you point out. And, and uh, it was a very, a very different and more overtly uh, Jewish world and Jewish neighborhood. And then you switched to the Jewish People's School, the folk show uh, when you were there as well. So why did your parents make that move? What was it they were looking for when they left the fringe of West Mount and moved to the center of, of Outremont? Well, that's a wonderful question. Obviously, that was one of the defining uh, aspects of my life. We don't choose to whom to be born to, and we also don't choose how our parents um, form us in some way. And um, my mother is the one who um, precipitated that move. My father's whole family remained in West Mount, and, um, you know, they lived there, and it was mm. close to the place of my father's work. So it was also much more convenient. My mother did not want to live there. If, if you're going to be very snide about it, one could say, looking for her motives, she didn't want to live there because my father's family lived there, right? Um, my mother couldn't help being, uh, is the word resentful? Uh, it, it's too unkind. You see, my father was there with his three brothers. And so my father's a large part of my father's family was there in Montreal. My mother had no one except these letters came telling her that everybody had been killed, right? So she was not kindly disposed, let's say, to my father's family or to being close to them. So the physical distance was one thing, but it was more than that. My mother wanted to be in a Yiddish speaking world. That's where she felt comfortable. And she wanted to be part of the Yiddish cultural community. There was a Jewish public library. There were Yiddish day schools and so on. I mean, why would she not move to the part of the city in which she felt more at home? And by the way, my father ultimately too, because my father and mother were very much alike in that way. They were both drawn to the same cultural circles. My father became 
very close friends with the principal and vice principal of our Jewish day school, for example. So it made sense for her in every way. I smilingly say we were the first and the only downwardly mobile, deliberately downwardly mobile family that I ever met, you know, because <laughs> as you say, wanted to move in the other direction. But for my mother, uh, I really do want to make it clear, it was never about becoming, uh, moving into poverty. It was never moving to the wrong side of the street. She moved into an area of Outremont, which was very wonderful. And then we moved higher up to the hill into the nicest section of Outremont. So it was not that she was slumming or that that was what she was attracted to. Not at all. Not at all. It's just that she had to, as far as the priorities are concerned, she had to be close to the Yiddish speaking, to the, what she felt was the more genuinely, you know, grassroots right. part of the, of, the, of the Montreal community. You know, I think, I, think for, uh, I think for most American Jews, hearing about the world you're describing a world with this extraordinary spectrum of, uh, of Jewish schools, most of them secular, at least until you got pretty far over. Uh, you know, this was something that was sort of unimaginable. It was not only another country you're describing, it felt like another planet, I think, for American Jews who still, to this day, generally don't know such a world ever existed or even could exist. Um, so my question to you is, can you describe briefly, you know, what did those schools actually look like who were the teachers and what did you learn there that, that you uh, consider a uh, gift uh, even to this day? Well, it's really hard. Children take for granted what's given to them. You know, we're all little sociologists in a way. There are things that we notice keenly. But for the most part, you take for granted that which you're given. Um, what I noticed, though, early on was I, I could see the differences between, um, for example, the left wing schools and the labor Zionist school that I attended. For one thing, we studied Hebrew and Yiddish. Right. So, um, anyone who was anti Hebrew was already in another world from the world which my parents really inhabited. Now, there were many such people. My parents knew many communists. And there was a real difference between people who are left, uh, secular leftists, as you say, and those who were, um, you know, in a, my school was called the Yiddish Volksschule, the Jewish People's School. Now, think of that, right? It, it is a holistic concept. And that's what we were taught day after day. No differentiation between religion. I mean, the word secular never came up. The idea, right. were you religious? Were you uh, observant? Or so, none of these questions ever came up. So in that sense, I am blessed because I actually grew up with this organic idea of the Jewish people as a holistic element. And um, the only things that were really uh, alien were those parts that felt themselves separate. So for example, the, the Jewish communists felt um, to me very antagonistic because what did that mean? Do you see, how could you be against? And on the other hand, also, by the way, um, when the, uh, the sort of the, this Jewish community, the part of the Jewish community that wanted to live and dress differently and speak Yiddish demonstratively because they wanted to live apart, when they came, this was also quite alien to me. You see, these two the sectors, uh, especially the, the ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities that actually moved up into the Laurentians so that they could be farther away and more intact. These were, um, you know, very different to me. The part that I saw was it, everything was part of it. And, um, and that's how my teachers felt. That's who they were. One of the principles was uh, translating um, the Midrash into Yiddish, putting out very knowledgeable uh, uh, editions of Midrash into uh, mm -hmm. Our principal, when he retired, translated Marcus Aurelius into Hebrew, right? Um, we had Hebrew poets teaching us, right? We had, uh, we had Yiddish writers teaching us. So 
you know, you know these, these differences that, that sprung up later, um, they've always seemed to me to be um, um, destructive, basically. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, when I, when, I, destructive. Yeah. when I got to Montreal, that was one of the most extraordinary revelations was how integrated it really was. In Jewishly oh, integrated, right. say, yes. That, that right. um, you know, the old machlekes, the old uh, disputations and, and divisions didn't really seem to prevail to that degree. And I think probably because it was so strongly labor Zionist, which embraced both Hebrew and Yiddish, um, the, the two existed side by side very comfortably and, and organically exactly as they should have. It wasn't an ideological, uh, you know, division that was taking place there. I remember the first day I got to Montreal, though, everything about it was so different for me. You know, I never, I come from New Bedford, Massachusetts. I've gone to school in Amherst. I had never seen anything, a city quite like this before. I'd spent time in New York, but that was a really different place. And the first day I got there, some friend said, why don't we go out? There's a Yiddish lecture taking place. So why don't we go there? And so we went, I don't even remember where, it wasn't at the library. I don't remember where it was now. But I remember I got out of the bus and an older man, I say older man, he was probably younger than I am now. But anyway, he seemed older at the time. He came up to me and, he, and we were looking out, maybe on the side of the mountain, and we're looking out over this gorgeous view. And I remember he said to me, he said, uh, you know, a, a, a beautiful and clean city. Nobody ever said that to me in New York City. So, you know, there were definite advantages uh, all around. But again, as I say, I think it was the I think it was the fact that some of those old divisions did not prevail to that degree that I, it was so, the communities felt so comfortable to me and so well, so welcoming. So. Well, may, yeah. may I, you remind me of something that once happened to me, uh, which is very much to the point, even beyond what you're saying. You see, um, one day my parents had taken me along to a lecture at the Jewish Public Library, which was then still on Esplanade in the older section of uh, the, the, closer to the immigrant section. And it bordered on a park and uh, it was a beautiful night and they were going into this lecture and s somehow or other, I did not want to go in. I cannot remember any longer. So I said, I would wait for them on this park bench just across from the library. And um, I sat there on the park bench and apparently fell asleep and Rochel Ravitch, uh, Rahul Ravitch came out afterwards after the lecture and she was the first one to find me asleep on the park bench. So she said to me, how could you fall asleep here? We're too afraid to fall asleep here. And I said, but uh, in Yiddish? I said, Ar around people who speak Yiddish? I mean, <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine how one could be fearful uh, in the area of the Jewish public library. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. To be so it's so secure that uh, you know that obviously yeah. I had no fears at all. Yeah. So let's talk for a second about the fact that no such schools ever existed in the United States. There were, of course, afternoon schools, Yiddish afternoon schools in the United States. But the idea of a you know a Yiddish school a school system that used both Yiddish and in some cases Hebrew as well uh, that's really quite extraordinary, and it really did come down to peoplehood. The, the Jewish day schools, when they finally picked up steam in America, they were basically parochial schools. They were in both senses of the word. They were they were essentially religious schools with varying degrees of religiosity. But they weren't schools where you went to study Jews, to study the Jewish people as such, as you might have done in a Volksschule. Is such a thing, could that ever change in the United States? Could the condition, or do you need not to have a real public school system in order for that to, to take root? Well, here, you know, we... Um, we come into a, an area which many people have wanted to see what you are describing take place. They have warned it. But to me, there's a big warning sign that comes up when this concept emerges. Um, life goes on. And what was possible in Vilna, what was possible in Eastern Europe, um, that Yiddish speaking world, it was one generation. You see, Irving Howe, with whom I worked, developed this concept of Yiddishkeit, that Yiddishkeit, and he said Yiddishkeit extended for 200 years. Now, yes, if you look at the beginning of it and the end of it, you could say 200 years. That's not the point. It never, ever lasted more than one generation because it can only last for that first generation of my parents who came from Orthodox homes. 
they put they brought this into their Yiddish world, but they couldn't transmit it because their children basically, of course, we spoke Yiddish at home, but that's only because my mother, you know, because of her, she insisted on us speaking Yiddish really at home. No other family did that. You can't build on a little family's history or something and say that. And my mother didn't do it as a Yiddishist either. She just did it because it was her, you know, she didn't want to move into one of the other six languages that she spoke. She wanted to keep the Yiddish. That was for her, her old home. So here's the point, you see, Max Weinreich is so precious to me, I can't tell you. He was my best teacher and he was one of the people I most admired. And one of the books I love most, by the way, which I would commend to everybody, is the history of the Yiddish language. Four volumes in Yiddish, two volumes in English translation. The most fantastic book. Now, Max Feinreich there shows you that Yiddish is the repository of Judaism. Now, this is true. Coming into it, Yiddish absorbs Judaism and it becomes the repository of Judaism. What's the problem? It does not work in reverse. In other words, you could be speaking the most perfect Yiddish and have nothing to do with Judaism whatsoever. So it does not work in reverse. Judaism, Yiddish becomes the repository of Judaism, but Yiddish does not generate Judaism. And that was a terrible mistake. He couldn't have known it because, you know, he built the Yivo. He built, you know, he couldn't have known it. Could he have known that his son would become a priest? And that in right one, 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 one son. One that one, one son. of his sons. Yeah. Yes. The other one would become a professor of, of Yiddish uh, uh, linguistics. But but you understand, but but the when I finally read the book of Confessions of a Jewish Priest that Gabriel Weinreich wrote, I had not wanted to read it, of course. I was so moved, Aaron, because what he writes there is people ask me, why did you convert to Christianity? And he said, I didn't convert to Christianity. I converted to religion. Right, right. Because he didn't know what Jewish religion was, right? Exactly. He didn't know what a Seder was. He didn't know what Shabbos was. And he was so drawn. There was something missing in his spiritual life. Now, is this, is this a story which, uh, which then becomes a moral tale? I don't mean it as such at all. I don't mean it as an exemplum of any kind. But it does tell you that there are certain things that cannot be transmitted in that same form. So it would have had to change and become right. religious schools. Yeah, I mean, culture is organic. We have to accept that. And, and it evolves in all sorts of ways. And of course, it is the genius of Jews that we've always evolved in response to our environment. We've always borrowed from the outside world, as Weinreich made very, very clear, right? And then we fuse it into a Jewish frame of reference. And that's been, it's been our great strength throughout our, our, our history and accounts for our resilience, I think. So I, I, I agree with you on that. There's no, nobody wants to turn back tide, I think, in, in that sense. And, you know, the, the conflation of Yiddish with secularism is often problematic, I think, as, as, you, uh, as, as you point out. They're not synonymous by any means. I have to tell you, I once went to uh, meet with the editor of the Forbits of the Yiddish Forward. This is many, many, many years ago. And I went into his office and totally naively, I said to him, oh, I'm so pleased to meet you because my grandfather was an avid reader. I said he was a junk man. And I remember every day he would come home from work and he would wash his hands and he would put on a yarmulke and he would sit down and read the four of it. And the editor said, it never happened. I said, well, yes, it did happen. It never happened. None of our readers ever put on a yarmulke. But he was wrong. He was really wrong, right? Yes, of course, of course. Jews didn't stop being Jewish, even in a traditional sense, uh, just because they read the four. No, no, and the forward was not uh, overtly it didn't redefine itself as secular in that way. You know that it's, uh, it's Ab Khan who stopped publishing um, Sholemash. It's very interesting to read Ab Khan as to why he stopped publishing Sholemash when Sholemash started to write in the 1930s this trilogy about the life of Jesus. Right. Um, now, this was, people would say, censorship. Here was his most popular writer, his most popular novelist that he was publishing. But 
Khan himself had evolved over the years and deeply, and he realized that this was going to be extremely offensive to right. the readers of the Forvitz, right? And so right. It, he knew who the readers were. He yeah, knew and they, and and they the threw readers. stones at Ashton Israel too. I mean, he, so yes, you know, this was a, that was very controversial. Yes, it was very hard. Yeah. Uh, Next time we'll have David uh, Mazawa, who is his great grandson who works here at the right, book center. He exactly. wants to explain all this and give the rebuttal. But, but I certainly understand what you're, you're saying, Ruth. But right. you yourself went through a transition, as, as you chronicle. You grew up in, in a secular home. I think at the beginning, at least, you say that you, but then you say, as mother sanctified Yiddish, father readopted some forms of observance that became somewhat more traditional. You also have this very poignant line where you say, my mother lit more Yorkshire candles than Shabbos candles. Oh, that's enough to bring tears to your eyes just because it's such a, a bittersweet sort of observation that you, you have that's sad for so many reasons. But now you tell us that you and your siblings keep kosher homes. So, yes. uh, yeah. So, so what happened? Well, the obvious happened. Um, and, it's, and, and it's a story for everyone. In the United States and in general, um, maybe not so much in Israel. In Israel, there's an organic Jewishness that is developing, that everybody can feel is developing. There's an Israeli Jewishness, a Jewish Israeliness. Things have merged in a way that the separations are no longer what they were before. In the same way that Ashkenazic and Sephardic and Russian and Ethiopian, and there's a, you know, it, it becomes integrated right. more in every generation. But in America, it's very different. And I think that people understand you're either moving in or you're moving out. Um, there's very little stasis. Right. It keeps changing all around us. It changes so quickly, much more than we could ever have imagined. And um, look, the whole education spectrum has changed in our lifetime. You know, what was possible for us once, what we thought of as Jewish studies once, uh, many things have changed. Some have come into being, the others have disappeared. So as, as everything changes, you have to know what your priorities are. Well, it so happens that the priorities of myself and my siblings um, was definitely that Jewishness is something of extreme importance to us. We were not speaking Yiddish to our children at home. Um, I tried with our oldest son for a while and I didn't feel it was natural. Um, for, for my brother, David, who actually spoke with his son Yiddish uh, until the boy was grown, they don't any longer. And his son certainly doesn't speak Yiddish to his child, you see. So that was not, so if something that large was going to be taken out of your life, that whole Yiddish cultural base that you were relying on, you had to, you had to invest something new in your life. And it, it, I mean, I'm making it too simplistic, but that's, part of it. Um, and, um, and the Jewish religious tradition um, is really quite something. If I may now say something that goes beyond the book, you see, my, my husband likes to go to shul. And um, during the last year of his life, and this last year of this last past two year and a half or two years of his life, he has not been able to go easily on his own. So I've become a shul goer. <laughs> for the first time, Sh Shine side. Yeah. <laughs> a regular shul goer. Well, and by the way, uh, we go to an Orthodox shul where the women sit in a balcony. And uh, someone said to me, a good friend said to me, I cannot imagine you, how awful, you sitting at the balcony. Well, this is hilarious to me because I love, I love sitting up there in the balcony just being able to read the Chumash and Davin at my own space. Anyway, to read the Chumash week after week uh, in that way, I'm very sorry that I didn't do it more for most of my life, frankly, because the wonder of the text, I mean, it's every week I come back and I say, what is this? I mean, it's, it's so overwhelming to me, you know? I know. So I have every week, I have the, even passages that I know quite well, but I've never studied them in that grainy way before. And so um, it, it's a wonder. We have a wonderful, we are a wonderful people. We have a wonderful inheritance. 
I agree. And as a people, we've had an extraordinary accretion of texts over the millennia. You know, one built upon the other upon the other, but we certainly got off to a really strong start with the Tanakh and, and we've been getting yes. strong ever since. So, exactly. and, and, and the beauty of this is to embrace that totality. That's the biggest challenge I think in the United States right now is where we don't embrace the totality. We, we once started a program called, uh, we started a program called Great Jewish Books to teach modern Jewish literature to high school students. And we first started out, I went to see the head of curriculum for the umbrella organization of Jewish day schools. This was a while ago. And uh, I explained, gee, I think it's really important that you include modern Jewish literature. It's not that radical an idea, but that you include modern Jewish literature in your curriculum. It's absolutely impossible. We don't have enough time in the curriculum as it is. We have to teach Tanakh. There's, there's no time for this. We can't, we can't possibly do this. So I said, to him, you know, if you sent your kid to public school and they said, for now on, we've come up with a new plan. We're not going to teach a single work of literature after Chaucer. I said, Jews would be the first ones out there, you know, uh, protesting this obscurantism. And on the other hand, you know, you're doing exactly the same thing in the school to cut the line and not to learn anything modern. So finally, he says, all right, all right, all right. You made your point. I'll tell you what. We're going to include it. We'll, we'll give it an hour. And I'm like crestfallen. I said, that's it? An hour a week? And he says, without a trace of irony, by the way, he says, Oh no, an hour a year, I swear to God, this is what he, uh, you know, this was his take on it. Something's very wrong with that roof to be that off balance. So what do we do? We ended up going directly to high school students and with the web, you can do anything these days. And that program has become one of our most successful programs that we run. In fact, during the pandemic, I thought it was gonna come to a halt because the students couldn't come here. And instead we realized, hey, it's online anyways, you might as well make it from a one week program to a six week program. So it became an upgrade. And we have more students apply for that program than we could ever possibly accept. Uh, and these are brilliant, you know, um, preternaturally brilliant young kids, you know, high school students sure. who, who throw themselves into Jewish literature and every page is a revelation for them. They never encountered that literature before. And now what we're doing is teaching teachers. So they in turn can teach. And, and once again, the teachers never encountered this. And now we're also teaching Jewish literature to rabbis because they too have never been exposed to no. most of the literature. So right. possibilities are endless. It just takes a little doing, right? Well, yeah, we do this too. But, um, and I'm very, needless to say, I'm involved in the same thing, podcasts. And I right. mean, of course, of course. Literature too, on, on every level, and it can be done now more effectively. But I think that you have to be very careful here. Uh, you have to actually look at the school curriculum, which we have done. These kids don't know Hebrew. Now, can you imagine Jewish children living in the diaspora who do not speak a Jewish, the national Jewish language? They do not speak the language of the land of Israel. This is unbelievable. Even those who go to school for 11 years, they don't speak Hebrew. I would say, isn't that something? Number two, how many of them in a Jewish day school can defend the state of Israel? They come to the universities, they come to the high schools, they are being decimated. And more and more of our children are becoming students for Jew killing in Palestine, as I call it. They, those are Jews who are students for Jew killing in Palestine. They're not non-Jews, those are our children. So they haven't learned that. They haven't seen the map of the Middle East. They haven't been instructed on how to fight. So to take that, how much of the Tanakh do these children really know? How much of Talmud have they ever learned? How much of Jewish history, which is equally important to you, do they really know and all the rest of it? That is one thing, but I would go further. They don't even know about America. How much of the Federalist Papers have they ever learned? How much of the Constitution do they know by heart? Now, the, this is our country here. We are citizens of this country. It's ours to protect and to defend and to interpret to our children. So what you're saying is, is, is wonderful for us and for yourself because it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. Yes, if you know X, Y, Z, this, 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 and this, of course you want to know Yiddish More. literature, Jewish literature. But you see, if I'm looking at the whole picture and you told me, Ruth, you tell me what the ABCs are. I have to confess to you, Aaron, having put my whole life into the teaching of Jewish literature and Yiddish literature in particular, do anything I could to make it more interesting to others. I would still say to you, I'm sorry. 
I mean, I, I would have to put something, I would have to make another set of priorities to precede it. I, mean, I, I agree. I agree with. I'm not. I'm I know. I, I'm not. I'm, tre- I'm not trying to yeah. persuade you. No, no, no. I, 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 I agree fully yeah. with you. Yes, yes. One needs to have a fundamental education first, and then you build upon it. But I want to keep building too. I don't want to lose any of it. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Absolutely. Right not to give it up. Right. I'm going to make a very deft transition. I know we don't have a ton of time left, but I just want to make one more uh, transition here and say that uh, you know, at one point, as you describe in the book, you and Len decide to make Aliyah. And you, and you go to Israel and you stay about a year, I guess, right? Uh, before before you came back. Right. I, I loved your description of Israel. You said Israel is the Wimbledon of Jewish disputation. That alone is enough to make one move there, you know? <laughs> Just yes. the For me, also. yes. <laughs> For you. But, uh, and, and there were practical <laughs> reasons why, why you left. And certainly nobody would ever question your bona fides when it comes to defense of, of Israel. But I am interested in your reaction to a letter you received after you came back to him from your friend Hillel Halkin. It was a year later and he said to you, you'll be back. Israel is the only place to live a committed Jewish life. And you also quote your friend Avram Sutzka, the great Yiddish poet. That's okay to say your friend, yes? Yes, yes, of, course. Yes, yes, of, yes, of course. course. Avram Sutzka, uh, when he wrote that he doesn't want to die far goit in, uh, is that, how we would say it, yes, in, yes, in, in, uh, in exile, you know, to, to Gentilified in, 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 in exile. But after all that you've accomplished here in the diaspora, do you disagree with uh, Hillel? Do you think that only in Israel can one lead a full Jewish life, or do you think it's possible to do that here in Golis as well? Well, it's, yeah, of course, I, uh, I defend my way of life very strongly. No, I love quoting Hillel in that respect, because there's one thing I think that one ought to understand. Without a doubt, Jews in America um, also know that the center of the Jewish people at this point in history, and always was, is the land of Israel. And uh, in our day, I mean, I think the greatest blessing of my life, may I say, on all fronts, is that my life coincides with the uh, return of the Jews to sovereignty in the land of Israel. There's there's nothing in my life to match that. So that still remains in a sense, a centerpiece and concern for Israel. And by the way, I think that American Jewry, if I may say so, in historical sense, will be judged primarily on one thing. Did you or did you not succeed in strengthening and preserving the state of Israel? We will be judged on that more than anything else. Yes, our survival, our creative expression and all that. But when push comes to shove, you know, now that it's there, the state of Israel, this is one of our primary things. That being said, Aaron, there's nothing lacking in our lives here. To the contrary. I mean, I think that we live the fullest life possible. We raise our children. We build our communities. We strengthen them. We think of world jewelry. And we think of this country. You see, I think that Jews play an enormous part in the United States of America. And I frankly think that we're letting this country down. We're, we're, base, we're badly let, letting this country down. A country can always be judged by the security and the creativity of its Jewish community. It seems strange to say, but you know, historically one can see that. If you have a real democracy, a real flourishing country that is proud of itself and that is able to coexist with others and, and, and really have pluralism, then the Jews will feel secure. The fact that campuses now have become a place of pursuit of the Jews, the fact that there are people in government, elected to government, who really are in their very essence anti-Semites. This has never happened in America before, that a person should be electable, even though they are known to be anti-Semitic. It's never happened. It didn't happen in the 30s. So no one ever ran on that kind of a platform. So I would say that our lack of self-confidence, our lack of moral self-confidence, our inability to come out more strongly as a community and to really speak for ourselves and explain why it's so important, I mean, so we owe it to America 
So I would say that we have a function here. I would say that to Hillel. You can't write that off, Hillel. We're living here. And as long as we're here, we have a very important role, not just for the Jews and the Jewish people, but we have a very important role to play in sustaining this marvelous country that is, by the way, exceptional, right? And, that, and, and, and to protect its freedoms and to speak for it in the way that we can. Um, so, I, so to that extent, you see, we do part company in a very profound way. I don't apologize for living my life here. Good, good. All right. I'm gonna end on a literary question, right? It's just okay. to bring us back to where we started from, and then we'll open up the, the gates to uh, our, our audience. So um, you write in your book that Cynthia Rosick was a friend of, is a friend of yours, and uh, Cynthia once accused you, however, of lacking, quote, literary imagination in suggesting that the sociological reality of the present day American Jewish community would seem to represent an almost insurmountable obstacle. Well, I think I might have some evidence for you that you can use as a retort to this. So a few years ago, I was working on a, before the pandemic, when life was a little different than it is today, I was working on a book and I had, uh, it was talking about Jewish literature and its possibilities. And I realized I didn't know how the book ended. And I said, hmm, I think I should go talk to Cynthia. She might be able to help me out with this conundrum. And, and so I went to her house in New Rochelle and it was a full blustery day in the winter time. It was very gray outside and it was beautiful and warm inside her house. Her house. And she had promised me rugelach, but she couldn't get any rugelach in New Rochelle that day. So she served <laughs> Madeleines instead. She thought that was sufficiently Jewish uh, resonance. And in fact, it did. And we talked and talked and talked for hours and we barely noticed as it started getting dark outside. And, and finally I said to her, so, so who are the great Jewish writers today? Today, right now, who are the Jewish writers? She said, well, we have Philip Roth and we have Saul Bellow. And I said, yeah, but and Bellow was already dead at that point. And I said, uh, I said, what about the generation after them? Who are the great Jewish writers, the great fiction writers after that, Jewish fiction writers after that generation? And the room's dark now and we're both sitting there. And she thought for a really, really long time, you know, maybe it was three minutes, but it felt like an hour and a half, you know, when you're sitting waiting for the, her answer. And finally, what she said was, I think we might be asking the wrong question. She said, I think this may no longer be that what we need now is not more Yiddish novels. What we need right now are more Jewish histories. That we have to have a better understanding of who we are before we can kind of resume the process of Jewish literary creativity. So my question for you is, um, in order, well, what she was saying is in order to better, un we need to better under understand ourselves and our antecedents before we can move ahead you know, with more great Jewish literature. Do you agree with her? Well, it would take me longer than, uh, you know, it's not a one, standing on one foot answer, but um, I would say that there are writers who write, um, Allegra Goodman has written always uh, out of a Jewish imagination. Certainly Dara Horn writes out of a Jewish imagination, writes very well, but I, it, it really has to do, as you know, with the history of the novel, too. Um, is that the form of this particular time? I mean, is, is this the age of the novel? Then, you know, there was an age of the great age of the novel. If it isn't, then where are the best minds going? And I think that what Cynthia may have been pointing to is that what we see is a tremendous outburst of creativity in aspects of the media, a kind of writing that's not been done so much before, right? That agreed, agreed. Essayistic writing and historical writing and merged writings, writings of different kinds. So you have to see where Jewish creativity is going. And, um, you know, let's see if I can get this right, just to, the, the, just to bring your, your example of, of literature back. You know, Norman Podhoritz tells the story of um, one, somebody once came to Gershon Sholem and uh, said to him, you know, this is terrible. Look in your generation, look at what Jews did. They went into philosophy and they went into this. And now where are they? And Sholem said, Jewish genius always knows where is the most important place to go. And now it's in the army. <laughs> <laughs> and so. All right, on that note, 
Ruth, the problem is interviewing you. It's so interesting. We could go on for four more hours here. It's going to be like the rabbis in B'nai Brock. They're going to wake us up. Yes. And say, hey, hey, time for the morning smile. But since we don't have that much time, and I do want to at least open up to a few questions. Alex, are you still with us out there? Yes, yes. This is a wonderful conversation. Sorry to cut it short, but we have so many questions from the audience. We will not have time for everything. So my apologies in advance to the viewers out there, but it's, it's a testament to how, uh, how much there is to discuss, which is a wonderful thing. Um, dovetailing on what you were just talking about, um, one of the questions in the, from the audience is, what are the urgent uh, topics of Yiddish cultural um, scholarship today? you know, in, in the scholarly world? What do you think are the urgent questions for, for the scholars of today and tomorrow? That's a very, very good question. Very penetrating question. It can't be answered by anyone but the scholars themselves. But for me, one of those questions has been really, um, you know, a, a very painful question. And that is, what's the Jewish responsibility for its, of, of, uh, of our involvement with communism? That's the most painful question we have to ask. And I think that sometimes we use the Holocaust and we use what happened to us, what was done to us in the Holocaust as a way of avoiding that question. How, how much are we implicated, especially the Yiddish world? How greatly is it implicated? Now, I'm not looking here. You see, the thing is, it's so delicate. It's not a question of retroactive blame. It's not that at all. But one has to make an accounting. We ask others to make an accounting for their past. This is the most troubling part of our past. How did we get so deeply involved in something which was so awful? Why didn't we see how awful it was? Why wasn't there more warning against it? Why is it still so much in the water? I mean, why are Jews still so attracted to that? The romance of communism, the way we were. Everybody still wants to keep those balls in the air, you know, like balloons. Well, they're not. You know, in the 1930s, uh, the, the millions of people were being killed. And we supported that ideology. We, I say, not the whole Jewish world. Of, a, yeah. As Jews, we did not. You see, you see, so that's a question that I would push. And... Um, and then the other question really is also um, what rises to the surface? So I know the women's movement has now, and, and the, the Jewish, uh, the Yiddish Book Center has been instrumental, especially this past year. This women's writers have been neglected. The women's writers have been neglected. It always makes me laugh when I see that. The only writers who have not been neglected in the last 20 years are the women writers. <laughs> but where are the men Yiddish writers? They've been neglected. I mean, there's there, there really no biographies being written. You know, there's no there, there's so little being done. Uh, you know, uh, one of the painful things of my life is I will never write the book that I wanted to write about Glotstein. I mean, uh, what a genius and how important and so forth and many others, right? So, so I would say that's another question: is what 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 do we want to cull? Really, you see, not just as best books. But what books still speak to people and have to be, uh, you know, have to be absorbed by our uh, current culture? Um, can I throw it? Can I just, Alex, can I just throw it? Please, a absolutely, question? please. I want to add a question to the question, though. A, li a little bit of field, but uh, Ruth, one of the lines you have in your book is when you talk about Glotstein, you said how Glotstein said that uh, he has to know Auden, but Auden did not need to know Glotstein. Yes. Uh, we now live in a very different world, though. It's vastly more multicultural. And people are reading all sorts of literature. I knew no Chinese literature when I was growing up and when I was studying. And now, we, you know, we're all aware of other literatures. Will that change the scene? Will that, does that mean that Yiddish has opportunities now that it hadn't had prior? Well, it does. Or, or to put it a different way, would its current audit need to know Yiddish, need to know Vajdin as well? Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm afraid at this moment in time, they have made the Jews very unpopular. You have to understand that. There was a great moment of Jewish flowering in the 1960s and 70s when Jews were very, very popular in America. And that was the great age of Jewish culture flourishing in English, in the English language. A tremendous array of great writers and thinkers and I mean, an intellectual community, the match of which we don't have today. And a campus today, 
the name of the Semitic Museum at Harvard was changed. They didn't want the name Semitic Museum. There's not a shred of its biblical past that's being shown in any of the Harvard things. Everywhere, the Jews are being made unpopular. Um, and so even Jewish studies has become so defensive as if the whole purpose of Jewish studies is to show how many gay people there were in Jewish studies, how many women writers there were in Jewish you know, me too, me too, me too. We, we also have that. Instead of showing what is in Judaism that is so strong and what is in Yiddish culture that is so strong, I think this is such a difficult moment for that, Aaron. And, 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 and this is really something that we should be aware of, that for our kids, I mean, for me, it was easy. The doors were really open. They, you just had to just push on them and know which door to push on. And, and for you, too, in a sense. I mean, not that it wasn't a Herculean job that you accomplished, but you didn't meet anyone coming against you. Now the forces against are very, very strong. And, um, and that makes our cultural possibilities, it, it makes the challenge much greater. It makes the possibility for heroism much greater, but it also makes it much more difficult. Alex? Well, there, there are so many questions. We're just about out of time. So maybe we can end on the question of, you spoke about how um, the role of Yiddish in Jewish identity and Jewish culture has really shifted over the course of your life. Um, and maybe you could speak about what, what do you feel the role of Yiddish is now and what will it be for the future? Well, the part of Yiddish life to which I think I'm fair to say both Aaron and I have consecrated ourselves is to answer that last question, is to say, what do we want to transmit now? What is it that we really want to take from this amazing world? You see, I, I would say that uh, from about the, the beginning of the 19th century to the middle of the to 20th century, um, the most exciting people and the most excited Jews, some of them no longer wanted to be rabbis. Some of them no longer were not, were not yet able to become university professors. You know what they all became? Writers. They all became poets and writers and playwrights. That was a great, that was a great. Now, the whole of modernity, the whole of Jewish modernity was forged in those years, and most of it in Yiddish. So think of it, all our entry into modernity, all the problems we grappled with, including sexuality and you know, aggression and, and you name it, 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 we know that those works are fantastic and they're all there for us to really grapple with. And, and we're the poorer for not knowing them. So that's the work that we have to do. As for what people say, you know, the raising our kids in Yiddish or whatever it is, well, um, you know, the, the, one is grateful, I suppose, for the Haredi communities that still function in that language, but that's not the choice we make. Um, to learn to live separately with separate clothing and with separate language and with separate mores to the degree that you want to be kept separate, I think that's a price, that's not, that's not the way we want to live. I mean, speaking for myself, it's not the way we want to live. It is a much more integrated life that we would like to be able to master. Uh, bringing Jews into the American uh, sphere. And, and to answer Aaron's question, yes, making it so that you should know about Glotstein as well as about another poet. Alex, before we bring it all back home, I just want to add my own words of thanks. And First of all, I want to thank Alex Weiser and, and the whole staff at YIBO for making this program possible and having both of us thank here, Ruth. I, I want to also uh, thank my assistant, Suzanne Rubenstein, who did so much work behind the scenes. But most of all, Ruth, I want to thank you. I, I thought that if this were the Oscars, we'd be giving you the Lifetime Achievement Award right now. But I'm really <laughs> glad there is no Yiddish Oscar, only because that would imply the end of a career. And... Uh, to borrow from Isaac Vesheva Singer's comments about Yiddish, I'll say the same about you. You've not yet said your last word. And so I wish you, Yatya <laughs> Koya, just Thank you, Aaron. Thank I you. owe you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, for both institutionally and personally. Thank you both. Thank you both so much. And, and this is a great note to end on that I hope that all the viewers out there will go and purchase Ruth's book. The, the link is in the, is in the chat box. 
Um, and also all of Ruth's other wonderful books, which are, you know, an, a, a huge testament to the literary world um, that you were just describing. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's Thanks, been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>